Hi class, good day. Uh, it's me, Dr. Ansid Vendela, and welcome to the College of Medicine. I'm one of your professors in the College of Anatomy, and today in this vid video, we would like to discuss the clinical importance of surface landmarks. But uh, before we begin, we would like to have or to set an objective. So for our first objective is to be able to understand the importance of uh, having the knowledge uh, on this anatomical surface landmarks. Number two is to be able to discuss some examples or the commonly used uh, anatomical surface landmarks. And number three uh, is to discuss some clinical applications or some examples on how we use this in our practice. So let's begin. <coughs> so for first, we need to discuss the anatomical planes. So here is a model and we now have three lines that can, uh, these are imaginary lines that can help us divide the human body. So first we have the sagittal line or the sagittal uh, plane which divides the body from back to the front. So you have a left and right part. Then you have the coronal plane. So the coronal plane or the frontal plane is where you have a line over here. So you can see in the model where it divides the body from the front to the back. So also we have the transverse plane which divides the body at the midline here, the half, or as you can see in the model. So in anatomy, we also have these directional terms. Directional terms are used to describe a location of a specific part of the body. So we, like this in this diagram, we have an imaginary line in the center and then immediately what's above is superior, what's below is inferior, what's in front is anterior, what's in, on the opposite is posterior. We also have a lateral which is a farther away from the midline and medial which is in the midline we also have uh, the distal which is farther and the, the proximal which is near the midline so again we use these directional terms to describe the location of a certain part that we would like to describe <clears throat> now for the next picture we have some key surface anatomical landmarks of the head and neck so you can see here the, the structures you can even look yourself in the mirror so you can see the superciliary arch the clavella the nasal bone ala of the nose these structures you can uh, discuss more when you go to the head and neck part of the the course so all of these structures are can be seen, can be appreciated without dissection, so you can really see them immediately. All the parts are um, listed. Now for the next picture, so usually in our uh, practice, especially me in the public setting, we usually encounter uh, medical legal cases so uh, mauling uh, someone had a fight so they come in the hospital and usually we note the injuries per region so for in this picture we have the frontal region temporal region if he had a black eye you can say the left uh, orbital region or if he had an accident in the motorcycle and he has a lacerated wood on the mental region, you can say lacerated 5 inches or let's say 2.5 centimeters lacerated wound on the mental region secondary to a motor vehicular accident. So basically, it's, it's a way to describe the location of the injury. So that's one way or one of the uses of having this um, um, landmarks so 
next we have here a picture of the uh, thorax and uh, some of its um, surface landmarks. So we have the jugular notch of the stern of the manubrium, which is also, also part of the sternum. Uh, we have the clavicle, and notice the red line. The red line is the uh, mid clavicular line. So on the fourth and fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line is where we have the apex beat, uh, also known as the point of maximum impulse from the heart. So you can also see the cephasternal joint and the siphoid process. And you have the costal margin, which is formed by the costal cartilages of the 7th to 10th rib. So basically, these are landmarks for us to locate some certain structures within the, the body. The next picture, which is the abdomen. Usually, in the abdomen, because it's a hollow space which contains many organs inside, normally don't see any protruding uh, protruding structures not unless if those are enlarged and has a pathologic significance so what we do is we have this imaginary lines or imaginary regions for us to divide the areas of the abdomen and certain regions you have some specific or you have assigned organs that can be seen in that area for example in the right hypochondriac region that is where the liver is located the epigastric region that is where uh, that's been uh, below the cephasternal joint or the side below the cyphoid process that's usually where is the the stomach is located and sometimes pain from the duodenum will be felt in that area also you have the le left hypochondriac region also have the right lumbar region, the umbilical region, the left lumbar region. You have the right iliac region or the right lower quadrant region. Usually this area is uh, sometimes or most exclusively associated with appendicitis. And the hypogastric region is usually uh, pain felt from the bladder. Um, left iliac region uh, sometimes pain can be felt here due to uh, renal stones kidney stones specifically or especially if it, it it radiates to the back but for women who also have pain in that area you would consider um, what do you call this uh, you would consider ectopic pregnancy so this diagram or this picture is really essential when you go into practice so you really must uh, memorize this by heart don't worry uh, you will discuss more on this when you go to the abdomen and uh, you can specifically uh, pinpoint structures in this region we also um, divide this area into four you have the right upper quadrant, the left lower quadrant, the right lower quadrant, the left lower quadrants. Basically using the same principles. So which areas or which structures are in those uh, region and then from there you can actually have an idea or you can actually have an idea on what is involved. Next, we have a picture of a person for pleural effusion. So you can clearly use your knowledge of surface anatomy since we're going to use the landmarks to pinpoint the location of uh, the point of insertion. So this is this procedure is done to remove excess fluid or fluids in the lung space. Uh, 
specifically in the case of pleural effusion it may be water it may be blood it may be pus so for in this case uh, usually the location is uh, two finger breadths below the angle of the scapula so first you must confirm if there's effusion through the use of an x-ray then if you're in a tertiary hospital of the or you have uh, plenty of machines available you can do an ultrasound guided but if you're stuck in an island or a place where we don't have any equipment so just use your knowledge of surface anatomy so usually it is done to intercostal spaces below the highest level of effusion so that you can clearly easily remove the, the fluids Next, we have a picture of a right ankle dislocation. So, I had an experience. A patient came in um, screaming of pain after playing basketball and landing on the wrong foot. So, after doing an x-ray, I immediately referred it to our consultant. Um, he referred this to the orthopedic surgeon. And then he told me that I need to reduce this one. So after doing an x-ray, of course, you cannot reduce if there's a fracture. So it's better to reduce if there's no break in the bone. Because if there's a fracture, you might be doing more harm. So after confirming with the x-ray that uh, it's only a dislocation, so the consultant uh, gave me the green light to reduce this one. So all you need to do is feel for the bones, touch it and then just have a person support the patient and this just pulled the bone or the foot downwards to return it to the original place because if you're not going to reduce it and this is going to inflame it may be it may need surgery later on and it's going to be very painful for the patient also because swelling will really ensue and when that happens uh, you can also have compartment syndrome and you don't want that to the patient so in my case in that particular patient the patient was admitted and was observed and was able to go home after three days without surgery so i used my knowledge of surface anatomy so that i can imagine the the structures involved and also with the aid of the x-ray. Next, we have a picture of a suprapubic uh, bladder catheterization. So, this is common among male patients who had problems in their prostate. Um, you cannot insert the catheter anymore because the prostate is really enlarged and no matter what you do, you cannot do it. Uh, the patient really will complain of pain especially if the bladder is really full and then all you can do is do a suprapubic catheterization so your knowledge of of surface anatomy will really help you in this procedure so you must first locate for the um, pubic bone and then feel for the the bladder behind it and, and measure around two finger breadths above the pubic bone and then you can feel the bladder then you can insert the needle and after inserting secure the catheter and then you can drain so this is like magic you can really see the the comfort in the patient's face when the urine is drained imagine you cannot urinate for for the past five hours and you've been holding it for the past let's say two three hours and there's nothing you can do and uh, you must thank your knowledge of surface anatomy that you can do this procedure there you go guys we have our first uh, lecture it's a short lecture but I hope you learned a lot from it and it's really nice to have our lectures done uh, in person so that we can uh, communicate and interact with each other you can ask questions 
and I really hope this pandemic will be over soon so that uh, we can be back to our normal lives again and I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I had a good time so till next lecture bye